Dear listener, welcome to this week's episode of todebate.eu, your podcast of debates. Which has been going on for at least 30 years. No, three years. Three, three years. Uh, 30 years. 300 years. I, I do think we probably have been the first real podcast of the universe. It's, or maybe the first of the European Union. What do you the think? The first of the European Union. Maybe. Maybe, maybe that 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 maybe. for sure. Maybe not the universe, but maybe for the European <laughs> Union. Um, our our tra transitions are clunkier and clunkier. So why isn't there a Dirks and Sebastian's transition fan club out there already? People that make Or fun voting. of us and and write and memes and think like that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but we have to say we have to, we have to admit. And hello, everyone, <laughs> Carol, dear, dear listeners, because I was in trouble without saying hello and yeah. how are you? But how are you, we, by we the way? Are you this. good? I'm We great. need to get this out of the way. <laughs> All right. So your <laughs> established fact, you're a great established fact. I'm well, too. So you wanted to say what? I wanted to say that although the actual debate is uh, prepared ahead of time, we prepare arguments ahead of time. We don't flip the coin like during the show and then, and then we record right away. The only thing that is improvised is that transition, <laughs> to be fair, right? The, the intros <laughs> and, the, and the outros yeah. and what we discuss around the debates is completely improvised. So in case our listeners are wondering what part is prepared, which part is not prepared, at least in my case, I prepared my first two minutes and a little bit more just in case to have, you know, in my pocket for my three minutes uh, of debating. But other than that, I don't prepare anything. So the transitions at the beginning where we try to say hello, everyone, and come naturally to the reason why we're debating the topic we're debating on and today. And we usually don't force it at all, improvised. right? It's kind of jumping at us immediately. It's, it's obvious. It's an obvious transition. Yes. Yeah. And now that we established that we are probably the oldest and most famous debating podcast of the European Union, where does that lead us to? Oh, that's tricky to get to the entire motion. So why don't we just state it directly? <laughs> Our motion today is the EU, the European Union, is nothing more than an economic entity. We will debate whether that's the case or not. Yes, and the flip of the coin made it so that I'm defending that position. So I will say the European Union is nothing more than an economic entity. And you're going to say what? That it is a spaceship and we are all passengers or that it is a pizza brand that you can get in your favorite pizza shop around the corner? That's interesting. I did not think <laughs> of that angle. I'm going to defend that it's an economic entity and everything else as well, except the pizza shop and the pizza spacecraft or whatever it is that you said. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I was I was thinking in my preparation. That's why I made this uh, half joke right now. When I was in my preparation, I wondered what is the thing I position myself against. And I thought the most natural what would be to say it's not only an economic entity, but also a political entity, a society entity, Correct. that so much more. And that's what I Correct. would try to position against. But I thought it's worth yeah, calling my, out. My, my main point will be exactly you, you correctly hinting at it uh, on the political perspective, cultural perspective, yeah. and perhaps also an emotional one. Uh, but I'll get back to that maybe in the, in the seg second segment in the three-minute piece. So why don't we get started? Uh, let's get started. Uh, but before, before, before that, maybe, I think I'm the one I'm the one for once who suggested that motion, I think. Uh, and, I, and I believe I came up with this when we were in the preparation phases of the, election, the European elections at the end of mm -hmm. May. Uh, and I think I was just listening to some of the political discourse. And I thought, well, maybe it's time to rethink what the EU is and how people feel about it. Yes, I think that is true. And I think it's worthwhile thinking about it. And uh, let's have this debate. Okay, let's do this. <laughs> Sebastian goes first and argues against the motion. Ich bin ein Berliner. This is what Kennedy said when he visited Berlin in the 60s. And it was aimed, so, among other things, against the Soviets to show that there would be uh, unity among the Western European countries. Um, and my point here is to say and to remind people that the European Union starts in the aftermath of the Second World War. It's much more than that today, and I'll come back to this in my second segment, but I want to emphasize how the EU is not just the economic entity that some, maybe some people will see it only as that. Trade is important. I'm not saying the opposite. 
economic, the economic unity of Europe is important, but it's beyond that. It's political, it's cultural. It could be much deeper than that, by the way, much more. And I wish it were actually even deeper than that. We'll come back to that afterwards. It is true. It is true that EU is a story we tell ourselves, just like France or Germany or the US are stories, narratives we tell ourselves about nation states. But, it's so, it is, but it is a story that is very much alive. For instance, for instance, very at the end of May, people showed up in higher numbers to vote at our latest European elections than they did before at the previous elections. Brexit, however unfortunate an example it is, is another example of European unity on a political level. The UK wanted, it have, wanted to have it its way. All the other European states within the EU banded it together and say, no, this is the rules of the EU. And just to remind again what I had reminded at the beginning, it was created as a union after the Second World War. And from the get-go, it was this political movement, a political union. And in these days, these current days of increased, increasing nationalism, it's maybe worth remembering that bringing that political unity to the fore allowed to bring a half a century of peace, stability, and prosperity. This is what the European Union proclaims, and this is what I feel has happened. We've had additional rights, thanks to the European Union, which goes beyond the economy, such as abolishing the death penalty across all member states, protecting consumers in very different levels. And this is all the notion of the, having this supranational level, this overall nation state that supersedes national sovereignties. Education-wise, you had the Erasmus program, which has allowed 3 million students to go across Europe uh, and uh, learn more from other cultures within the EU and slightly beyond. And culturally, you have more grants and, ne and additional networks to support arts and cinema and heritage days and the capital of culture that happens every year and that probably everyone has heard of. So the EU is an evolving entity. I'll get back to that. But clearly, it's much beyond just an economic entity. And now on to Dirk. Let's hear his argument. Let me start by asking you a question, dear listener. Yes, I mean you, dear listener. Ask it to yourself in your head. Who is the head of state of the EU? If you don't know, then you're in good company, and the reason is simple. There is none, because the EU isn't a state. Now, what else then would turn the EU more into than just an economic entity? Let's think about this for a moment. Um, how about a European constitution? Yeah, sorry, we don't have that. A European army? Mm, oh, well, would be nice. We don't have that either. A European legislation, that's the thing that is more than just an economic uh, entity, right? Yeah, uh, well, uh, no, kind of. Uh, despite everything you may have heard, the EU cannot pass laws. The EU can pass reg uh, um, regulations and the member states pass laws that may or may not follow these um Regulations and some of these regulations are actually not binding either. So, mm, nah, no. How about a federal system? All European member states acting as one in a key issue. You said you heard an example in Sebastian's piece of that. Actually, as many examples as you may come up with, Sebastian, there are like twice as many where the contrary seem to be true. We are not really capable right now to have a joint common theme how to protect our borders. We cannot make up our mind whether how to help Iran. If EU would act as one complete entity, then we could be a counterbalance to how the US right now deals with Iran. Despite most of the member states disagreeing with the US policy, we cannot come up to, uh, with, a, with a joint uh, solution to that problem. So, I would say most of these things are not working. So, what is working then? Right, the EU is distributing money between member states. Most of them share the same currency. We are a shared trade zone and we allow goods and workers to travel freely in the EU. If this is not a clear focus on the economy, then I wonder what is. Now it's Sebastian's turn. Let's hear his rebuttal. So one thing we're not debating about is whether the EU satisfies the condition of being a sovereign state in itself. What we're debating about is whether it's just this trade economic entity. And that's why we chose this word entity to avoid defining whether it's a state or not. Regardless of that, 
if we look at the aspect of a constitution, let's say this political unity around fundamental rights, we do have a charter. It's not called a constitution. It's called a charter of fundamental rights. And I insisted on the specific element of that charter, which has been ratified by every member of the European Union. And that's the death penalty. Now, it may seem obvious for European citizens, but the reason I bring this one up is because the death penalty is not abolished in the US, which is another great superpower or democracy, whatever you want to call it. It's just to illustrate the difference in philosophy, in politics that you have between two major entities, the US, the United States, and the European Union, right? And this is not nothing. It's not a given. In fact, when France abolished the death penalty in 1981, and probably today, still, I don't know, but the opinion polls were against abolishing the death penalty, which shows the strength, the power of a union of political forces, which go beyond purely a monetary union. You mentioned something else about, oh, uh, which, which implied that the European Union is not perfect. I agree. It's not perfect. There's a lot of criticism, left, right, and center. And this is why I hinted at, the, at what I said at the, at the end of my two-minute piece. The EU is an evolving entity. It is not set in stone. It's evolving with time. It's evolving with new members joining in. It takes multiple shapes. It takes multiple forms. And this European identity, which is beyond trade, has been redefined with each successive enlargement. So it is true that with Eastern European countries coming in, the EU, it seems like we're not really a civilization threatened by totalitarian regimes like it was in the past with the Cold War, right? And this is why maybe the Western European countries seem to be a bit confused. What is the EU today? And at the same time, you know, we're not sure whether, you know, the EU, is it a, an answer to the concerns of the past? Is it addressing challenges of the future? We're redefining that entity all the time. We're redefining this in terms of science, in terms of culture, in terms of education, in terms of economy too. It is true. It is an important component of our lives. So what more could it be? And this is very, very personal. It's almost, I have a dream, but I've already done this for the very first debate. So you can go back and scroll into the archives when I use this rhetoric, which was used before me by famous uh, people. I have a dream. So of course, sharing the same currency, this is economic. We're partially there. We have 19 countries in the EU who share the same currency. We could share the same military. It has been in the discussions for the past 50 years. It takes time. It's not easy. I believe we'll get there. If anything, if anything, to save on costs. And it will be closer to this notion of a nation state. I have a dream that also it will become an emotional entity one day where people feel, hey, I'm both German and European. And guess what? We already, it is already the case. We already are citizens of the EU and citizens of our member state. But I would like people to feel emotionally connected. And I believe we'll, we'll get there one day because I think the youth will get it more than maybe our, our older generations, which may be more stuck in the past. That's my hope, that's my dream, and I think that's the evolution of the EU. Now, it's Dirk's turn. Let's hear it. So here's the thing. Most of the stuff that you hold high in your description of the EU has nothing to do with the EU per se. Let's pick the death penalty issue. Except for Belarus... All European countries abolish the death penalty. All European countries, including those that are not member states of the EU. You live in Switzerland right now. I don't think Switzerland has the death penalty on their books, but they are not in the EU. Neither is Liechtenstein, for instance. And there are a bunch of others that, uh, that come to mind that also are not member states and still had the brain and the heart and the culture and the values to say death penalty is not uh, something we want to uh, carry into modern times. Even Russia indefinitely suspended the death penalty. To be fair, they still have it on the books, but their highest courts in Russia actually codified the suspension. So they are not killing people despite Russia not being a member state of the EU. So the EU is not giving us a death penalty free world. And the example you made pointing to the US is basically making that point for me. If you are uh, something more than an economic entity, well, it doesn't make a difference, right? So the, the US could force a death penalty free world anytime, but they don't want to, and so they don't care. And the EU 
probably cares just as little because we sometimes only have a very thin layer over our economic policies. Another case in point, the current crisis on our borders, the current the current uh, refugee crisis. I think it demonstrates pretty clearly that the only thing we really can get to an agreement to is our economic situation. Everything else, everything that's based on culture or exchange or being a value-driven community and society falls apart as soon as people need to deal together with something where they feel they can just push it to one of the member states. So no, um, I, I, I beg to differ. The only thing that's working really, really well for the EU is all things trade. We are an, a massive trade body in this planet. We force a lot of people under our trade policies. And yes, every once in a while that comes with also a political win. A uh, good example is GDPR, a model that others seem to follow now around the globe, where we go into leadership. But I would argue this is also about having an economic advantage and less about being anything else but an economic entity. So my point really is this. We like to sell things with the cloak of a culture and society. But in the end, the countries in the EU, the cultures, the people are so different, are so diverse and are so not aligned that it's, then it's hard to call the EU anything else but a, an economic and trade-driven entity. Everything else is just about being European, which would work just as well without the EU. <laughs> Final statements. Sebastian goes first. So diverse it is indeed. And millions, hundreds of millions have benefited from the organization, from the enshrined rights of that the EU has defined. The organization of Erasmus for Students, Heritage Days that millions attend every year across, across the European Union. The capital of culture visited likewise by, by millions. Voting at the elections, the highest turnout at European elections in 20 years. People care. It's 50% of how many? 400 million, 500 million European citizens who actually turn out and decide to vote who are going to be their political leaders, not just economic business leaders. Death penalty, yes, maybe it is not an exception in the world, but it's all this together that makes the EU. It's not just one thing separate. The fact that there are no borders, people can freely move, not just for jobs, but also for residency and can just do whatever they like from one country to another. It's getting closer to this notion of supranational state, but that's not even the point today. The point today is saying it's more than just trade or economic, e economics. And going forward, there's a lot to be done still, a joint army and this emotional connection that I'd love for people to have, to feel even more to the, to the EU and come up with joint projects for many, many things that we can do all together. So yes, I really firmly believe the EU is more than an economic entity, way more. Dirk. Three countries have the most of the EU. France, the UK, and Germany. Now it's been said if France would as another country leave the EU, that would be the end of the EU. Why is that? Because after Brexit, we will be just two main partners in the EU, everybody else being a satellite state. With the rise of Le Pen in France, this is actually a real risk. It may just very well be that in some future election, the, the, the outcome looks quite dire. The union that you try to bring up here is actually not that firm. All European member states have to fight European critical parties and there are more forces than ever calling for leaving the EU and leaving it alone. So, yes, I feel strongly about it as well. Yes, I feel like a European. Yes, I would like to have something like the United States of Europe. And I know that especially Americans often confuse the model we have in the EU with their own model. But the fact of the matter, the sad fact of the matter, I might add, is it's just not true. The only thing that's truly working, the only thing that's also only accepted is trade and economic policy. And why is that? Because France... Germany and the UK so far saw that as a cornerstone of their security and prosperity, and that's right now falling apart.
That was my final statement, right? That was your final statement, correct. And you had your final statement as well. So we are done with today's debate. We're done. Now I'm sad. Now I'm depressed. Yeah, it's not depressed <laughs> what you said. <laughs> Uh, shit. <laughs> no, but I mean, you, we... you make a strong point. I, the thing is, I between my wishes for what the Europe, what Europe could be, and on one end what it is today, and on the other end, the fact that I don't want to be oblivious to the fact that it is a story that we tell ourselves. It's just a mental construction, which I believe is worth it because it helps people, you know, to to band people together and have peace and. Hopefully, have you know research and space and science projects together. Still, yeah. I, I, I'm at this, at this, it's this position I'm in where I feel like I have my aspiration and where it is today. That I feel there's a there's a huge gap, and I feel depressed when I hear you because obviously you paint a picture, a dramatic picture of what it looks like to you, or at least during the debate. So that's why I'm ending up with this sad face. Yeah, I dug, I dug up everything that was that is annoying to me when I look in today's policy and today's events. So, for instance, I I firmly believe that in this in this world we live in right now, the only way to to play a real substantial positive role would be something like the United States of Europe. We should get our act together and we should band together and we should be another force next to the US, Russia, China, um, just to have a strong voice that's uh, that's putting another model in front of the deal-driven policy of Trump and the dominance-driven policy of a Putin and, uh, and the dominance-driven policy China is driving. So I wish that we would be that place. But the fact of the matter is we cannot agree on anything. I mean, all of Europe, and, and literally all of Europe right now, sees the US as having broken the Iran um, nuclear treaty. All of Europe is skeptical about this and is scared about the consequences of another war in the Middle East. And all of Europe promised to Iran, hey, we're gonna find a solution, we help you with a revenue stream that's not in the US. And we fail! <laughs> Embarrassingly so. And we wouldn't fail if we would actually be the union that we claim we are, because if we we are the we are the the, the largest marketplace on earth, we move trillions of dollars. The only reason why we are weaker than the U.S. or weaker than China is because we are not speaking with one voice. And yes, it was a hopeful sign that we had the European elections with that much of a turn up, but it was also, mind you. This election was on the back of a number of really highly visible debates that all were European in nature, like the debate around Article 13, like the debates, um, our refugee crisis is very European as well. So we had a number of high profile debates just, uh, just before the election and that may be, have been a factor as well. So people stood up for this. Ironically, yeah. ironically uh, I am worried with what I'm reading that this economic entity would be the first to fail before any of the other reasons why we unite as Europeans politically, culturally, and other other possible reasons. The reason I mm -hmm. say this is as to why I'm scared that this would be the first to fail is two things. One is Brexit and the Brexit rhetoric and saying, oh, we want to control our own trade. How dumb is that? Let's not debate this. We already talked about it. Uh, but I worry about this, this undercurrent of parties, maybe all generation people, or, or this fear that people have that translates into, oh, I want to protect my border. And the second thing is all the lies from some countries, uh, like Italy, like Greece, um, for, in some cases to join the Euro, which they should not have, uh, if, uh, uh, if the accounting was honest back then. And the second thing is the debt that they have accumulated. So there are concerns that the Euro could disappear as a result. Right, or that the economic stability of the EU is actually not that strong. I'm not a, I'm not a banker. I don't know the details. Just read, and this is just my interpretation with layman uh, terms. But mm -hmm. I, I am concerned this could be the first to fail. And then at, if that fails, you know, the rest hopefully you know, still stick around. And look, and the reason I say this is look at the reaction of foreigners living in the UK. I, I think most people don't really care or understand rather what it means in terms of trade. Businesses care. But as an individual, you yeah. care about being able to live in the UK. 
the no border aspect, right? Like I don't want to have a problem with a visa. And that's the political unity, right? So I think people care yeah. a bit more about this aspect because it's very tangible for them. Now, of course, if you if you have to pay more, uh, you know, a, a pricier amount for the same goods, you, you're going to feel it too because of customs and whatever. But this is why I'm actually a bit worried, ironically, that even though it seems the strongest right now, the economic entity, it feels also to be strong on weak pillars. On, on how do you say, on legs of clay? I don't know whether this question in English, where you have very, very weak footing. Very true. Also, we, we haven't done ourselves a service in the past. So I think most people in the, in the, in the course of the, of the global uh, currency crisis, the co global economic crisis, knew that um, we attempted or still attempt to bail out Greece and make sure that Greece is not completely going down. And what most people have in their mind is that we are basically paying their debt, right? In fact, if we if we only, then this crisis would be over by now. This is the the sad truth is is that we basically gave Greece other credits, and we we stood up for those credits, but no one actually draw drew a line and said, okay, Greece, we we take off half your debt and make sure that the following policies are followed. Instead. Germany, France, and yes, the UK is making money out of the crisis in Greece. And this is, these are things that, uh, and, and at the same time, it, it kind of kills the, the support in Europe it, uh, itself, because to the layman, it looks like, oh, now my tax dollars are used to pay the debt of Greece, which is not true. And at the same time, if that is the reason for people not supporting EU anymore and, and uh, the giving rise to anti-EU parties, it will kill the very support we could give them. And so, yeah, as you say, it, I think it's it's a very strong point that it's the, our strongest and weakest pillar at the same point. Uh, yeah, at the same time. So, uh, finally, I, I mentioned Greece, but actually Greece is maybe not the biggest risk to the EU, right? The GDP of Greece is about 1% of the EU's yeah. GDP. Uh, it's countries like Italy. Italy, is pretty yeah, heavy, Italy yeah. would be a, a risk, right? If it bails out and, you know, with these populist uh, government in place, you know, what? You, who knows what could happen, so. Yeah, with the latest with the latest statements, I, I read from the- Salvini? The probably soon Italian prime minister. It's basically close to a fascist, what he's saying. Anyway. Fun um, times, but I think, I think to conclude on this one, uh, I, I, my hope, my hope is, is with the latest European elections that uh, the younger generations, our generation, is actually turning up to elections, running up yeah. for elections also, uh, so that you know we can change the course of what we want to see. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a shame that most most politicians are usually almost retired people, honestly, by, by the average age or the ages that they have. And it's nothing about age, it's about caring about the next generation. If your lifespan is limited, you know, what incentive do you have to care about what's happening in the next 40 to 50 years? And that's why Brexit is a disaster. Because when you look at the age pyramid, well, the youth did not vote for Brexit, but they're going to suffer the consequences, good or bad. So mm -hmm. my, 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 I remain optimistic. I hope that there's going to be an increased interest in the European Union and that the the youth or the younger generations now, our generation, uh, and some of us will you know, come to power in these instances at the European level, will hopefully shape things in a good way. I, I, I want to remain optimistic. I agree. Now, um, this was today's debate. Let us know what you think, whether Sebastian's arguments convinced you or mine. If you think like Sebastian, the European Union is so much more than just an economic entity. It's a thumbs down you're gonna click. And if you think Dirk was right, it is just an economic entity, then thumbs up. Uh, we still keep a close eye on our dashboard and uh, this is how you can give us easy going feedback. But if you feel strongly about arguments we've made or if you feel like we left out arguments or you want to share an opinion, please do that as well. Mail at todebate.eu or wherever you want to get in touch with us. We are pretty much everywhere. Just look for to debate. Feedback is a gift. Feedback is a gift. <laughs> and thank you, this, Sebastian. Thank you to you. Talk soon. Bye. Bye-bye.